So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is Gita Sagal, the director of the Center for Secular Space, a think tank she established after leaving Amnesty International following her complaint about their relationship with Mozambique and cage prisoners. The Center's first publication, Double Bind, explored the relationship between the left and the Muslim right. Gita was a founder of Women Against Fundamentalism and has written on Muslim, Christian, and Hindu fundamentalism, among others. Her films include The War Crimes File, investigating the role of British Muslim fundamentalists in Bangladesh during the war in the early 1970s. One of the men she investigated was convicted in absentia by a tribunal in Bangladesh. So please give a very warm welcome to Gita Sagal. Well, friends, it's extremely exciting to be here today uh, because gatherings like this are extremely rare. Come here. Where was that um, maybe I should sit forward because there, there are some mics here. Okay, is that better? Yes. Okay. Uh, gatherings like this are rare because mostly people who are on the left and secular, uh, which we're often told is the, is, is the, the prevailing consensus of our times and is actually uh, oppressing people uh, who have a religious identity. Um, and yet, um, such gatherings as ours have found it very hard to get together and meet. Um, uh, and so I'm very, very grateful to uh, Mariam Namazi and Mariame Eli Lucas and all the other organizers who actually had the vision to hold this conference and, um, uh, and, and bring us together uh, here in London. Um, I was, wanted to talk to you about who's afraid of secularism. And I knew that following Mariam and Marie Aimé, um, that you would uh, have heard and in fact have experienced yourselves already that many of the people, as, as Peter indicated in his opening remarks, who should be our closest allies, if we see ourselves broadly as progressives, <coughs> left, perhaps liberals, uh, who are supporting uh, an order which upholds human rights, uh, which respects the constitutional principles for which many of the peoples of the world have struggled across the years in many, many nationalist movements, which we're going to hear about over the course of the day, and uh, which, um, it, which struggle actually to do the things that we are asked to do or which human rights movements quite often ask gov uh, governments to do um, you know, in upholding the treaties that they've signed up to. Yet when we take up those stands, we are often not supported by the peace movements, by gender studies, by a whole set of post-structuralist, post-colonial theorists uh, who you would think would understand the mechanics and dynamics of imperialism, and colonial um, uh, patterns of rule, um, and uh, by uh, a whole range of other people, uh, not just people, but institutions, such as the liberal paper, The Guardian, whom Taj Harge, who I hope is here somewhere in the audience, memorably called uh, the echo chamber of the Wahhabis. Now, those of you who, who don't live in London, and I'm, I'm sorry, really, to most of my remarks are going to be confined to this rather small northern island that, that we meet on. Um, and you, I know, are facing many struggles, very acute struggles uh, across the world, and many uh, of, of people sitting on this, on this platform. Um, but the significance of London and of Britain are the connections bet between its imperial past and its its post-colonial present, which has carried the policies of communal divide 
and uh, into its modern um, structures and forms. Um, so what we have is um, a coming together of the views of supposedly progressive and left and liberal and peace movement activists uh, with the views of MI5 and six and um, uh, the security agencies. So for instance, we have, uh, you know, I'd like to just, well, we don't, I don't have much time, so just introduce you to a couple of key figures which help us understand some of the ways in which uh, the opposition, the, the work on counterterrorism in the war on terror has been conducted. So I'd like to introduce you to a man called Robert Land Lambert, who is now an academic and works on the Center for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence. And he's done a lot of consultancies around these issues for the government and for academic sources. His main interests, he says, are counterterrorism and Islamophobia. And he um, was a senior police officer working in the Met. And he says that the thing that he's most proud of and that he will stand by is the work he made on the Muslim contact unit which was about learning from his mistakes of the past. What was his past? He was unmasked recently as an undercover agent who had infiltrated and lived with activists in animal liberation movements, in Greenpeace, and in many other movements. He's accused of being an agent provocateur who may have planted bombs, although he denies that. And he's currently under investigation, as are many other police officers who um, uh, it's, it's been revealed, were spying on peaceful, legal activists. Now, why is he proud of the Muslim contact unit, although he admits that some of what he did earlier was wrong? The Muslim contact unit was a unit of Scotland Yard, uh, of, the, of the police in London, which brought political Islamists into uh, the framework of working with the state of listening to the, what Mariam referred to as the moderates against the extremists. In order to fight Al-Qaeda, the Muslim Brotherhood, and the Jamaat-e Islami, and indeed, some Salafi jihadis such as Muazzin Beg were brought in to work with the police. This was considered by the British government a successful policy. Although it's recently come under attack, that has been it, the dominant one. Then we have Alistair Crook. Uh, a former MI6 agent, so he dealt with um, uh, uh, dealing with, he, he, he was a spy on behalf of the government abroad uh, in the secret intelligence service. And it's the secret intelligence service which helped to create back channels to the IRA um, uh, of, and, and to separate moderates from extremists and to start discussions which eventually fed into the Irish peace process. And if you hear um, Jonathan Powell, who is a uh, support uh, an advisor to Tony Blair, who's just written a book called Talking with Terrorists. And he and Elizabeth Manning and Buller, who is a former head of MI5, have been arguing very strongly that we must talk to Al Qaeda. And we are now in a moment where uh, the big Al Qaeda voices, the Al Qaeda supporting voices uh, from organizations like CAGE, which is, uh, uh, styles itself as a human rights organization, although our book, which is on sale outside, explains in great detail why, uh, although they do some work which is connected with human rights, their basic framework is that the prisoners that they're defending are prisoners of belief. Uh, uh, they, they, they do not talk about the fact that many of them have been tried in properly constituted courts, uh, some of them have been admitted uh, guilt, uh, you know, pleaded guilty to their crimes uh, and have been tried for, uh, or, uh, you know, planning terrorist attacks or inciting racial hatred or religious hatred and so on. Um, so they allied those with prisoners who have been held in places like Guantanamo and never uh, faced trial, who've been rendered and faced clear human rights violations. Um, so an organization like CAGE was involved uh, very publicly, if you've been following um, uh, the reporting on the fate of the, the hostage, Alan Hen Henning, who went to Syria uh, to do, as uh, we're told, humanitarian work with a charity that was um, uh, very well known to Cage. Uh, I have to be very careful what I say because they have a lot of 
very good human rights lawyers on their side and extremely litigious. Um, and uh, uh, Baig, uh, who was in jail, was recently released after the collapse of his trial when it emerged that MI5 was very, uh, which had urged his arrest, but had also um, apparently known uh, a lot about his activities. We're not precisely sure what it was that MI5 said that caused the collapse of his trial, but clearly there had been contacts. This is agreed by both sides, extensive contacts between MI5 and Baig, and it was considered that he should not be put on trial for uh, fur furthering uh, various uh, forms of terrorism. Um, so I just leave you there with that taster, because what we're seeing is the, the use of key parts of political Islam from the Middle East and from Bangladesh and Pakistan and India, the Jamaat-e-Islami from South Asia, the Muslim Brotherhood from the Middle East, who met and allied together here in London. We can see them very close by in East London uh, with the Jamaat-e-Islami central um, uh, organizational base being the East London Mosque, and next door to it, the London Muslim Center, where such people as uh, Rashid uh, Ganushi and Kemal El Habawi and so on, all of whom denied they were Muslim Brotherhood until it became uh, convenient to say that they were. So that those of us who said that they were or said that the Jamaat-e-Islami were the Jamaat-e-Islami are regularly labeled as Islamophobes. Um, so that policy of allying with these people and actually using them to control the mass of Muslims in Britain who are not Jamaat-e-Islami or Muslim Brotherhood or even Salafi Jihadi. Um, they are the ones who've been used to uh, actually lead government policy. This policy was started initially by um, Tony Blair under Labour and has been criticized by the Conservatives, but many elements of it remain, and particularly with this new thing about talking to Al-Qaeda. Uh, where Al-Qaeda is seen as the people who can negotiate with ISIS on behalf of British hostages. Thank you. <laughs>